Welcome back to The Breakfast and Plus TV Africa. Second conversation is about the suspension of fuel subsidy by the federal government. After weeks of uncertainty over whether or not the federal government intends to go ahead with a planned removal of petrol subsidy, the Minister of Finance, Budget and National Planning has announced that the subsidy removal will be suspended till further notice. This announcement came after a meeting between the Senate President, Ahmed Lawan, and the Minister Zainab Ahmed and Minister of State for Petroleum Resources, Timipera Silver. This came in amidst a threat by labor union to embark on a national strike. Now, to help us look at the implication of this, we have joining us Nika Gule, uh, Public Affairs Analyst. Nick, it's good to have you join us this morning. Good morning. Thank you very much. All right. Um, let's start off on this note. The Petroleum Industry Act actually categorically faces out the fuel subsidy um, regime or removal, as it were. And if you want to look at it by February, uh, we probably should not be talking about uh, whether or not the government is going to be involved in uh, subsidy removal. Uh, what does this make? What's the implication of all of this now that the federal government has taken a U-turn? Could this be that the law is turning on, on itself? Well, th I thank you very much for that question. I think the government of Nigeria has it all to blame itself for boxing themselves into this petrol subsidy regime that they have implemented over time. And it's unfortunate that the present APC-led government in their manifesto made it very clear that they were going to do away with this subsidy regime. Because in their own words, they said that it was a scam. And truly, there is the, the fuel subsidy thing is like a black box. You will never be able to understand it. And the reason why I blame the government for boxing itself into this quagmire is that there are many other products in Nigeria that are even more essential to Nigerians that the government doesn't bother the price at which Nigerians buy it in the market. I'll give you a few examples. Food. There is no human that can do without food. But the government is not bothered about how much we buy food in the market. Drugs. When we are sick, we need medicines. Without those medicines, we will likely die. The government is not bothered about how much we buy medicines in the pharmacies. The same thing for rent. The same thing for, for, for buying clothes, for buying uh, electronics, for buying houses. The government is not bothered. The government has allowed all those things to be priced in accordance with market forces. Even in the fuel sector, kerosene, which is the, the fuel that is used almost exclusively by the poor, the government has deregulated it. And the poor people are going into the petrol stations and buy kerosene at market prices. The same thing with diesel. Diesel that is used by the productive sector. As I speak to you, all the big buses, all the trains, all the trucks that are conveying the masses to and fro from their places of work and their homes are on diesel. And the price of that diesel is at the market, at the market rate. And the operators of those transport systems have already passed those market rates to the poor people who are in those buses. Farm equipment like tractors, we have factories, we have offices, they are all on big generators that are using diesel. The government is not bothered about how much they buy the diesel because the price has since been deregulated. But when we now come to a single product in Nigeria, one product called petrol, PMS, the government insists that the petrol must sell at the same price all over the nation. So the government is doing two things. First, it's fixing the price, which is what the former uh, PP, PPRA were doing. And then the government is ensuring that the price must sell at the same rate from north to south, east to west. That same government that we see a cow 
sold in Katina for 30,000 and sold in Lagos for 500,000 without doing anything about it. That government insists that this single product must be sold at that same price all over the nation. But again, the government again is also boxing itself further into trouble. How? Because Nigeria has a refining capacity of 445,000 liters, I mean, of, of barrels of crude oil every day. If those refineries were working at full capacity, they will have, they will refine enough petrol for Nigeria's consumption and have enough for export. But the government has not allowed the refineries to work. Neither is the government interested in either leasing out the refineries or selling them out. The government is sitting on top of refineries that are not working. Refineries that we are spending almost half a trillion every year to run and refine zero barrels of crude oil. All right. uh, the, the other thing is that this government have not let the refineries to work is now the sole importer of petrol. But, but, Why is the government not allowing the private sector to come in and import the petrol? But that's so what. That but, but, but the PIA actually allows that deregulation and pricing concept. That's the legal framework, and that's what the PIB ensures. And so, if the government had already passed that, I mean, we have the PIB as a law, as an act now, and we should govern the activities, you know, of the oil sector. I mean, to some extent. Then why is the government not going back and saying we cannot? That, that, exactly. So these are the issues. A government that has signed a law, have, have signed a bill into law, is not implementing the law. It's not letting the law operate as signed by the president. So this is the issue. You see, in the UK where I reside, you can have a petrol station opposite to the other one, and they are selling petrol at different prices. The same way you go into a market, one trader can be selling a bag of rice at a slightly different rate from the other trader because both of them are trying to make a profit, but depending on their cost efficiency or where they source their rice, they could sell their rice at different prices. So why is the government not taking a simple step like that by saying, look, if anybody wants to import petrol into Nigeria, go ahead and import the petrol we, as a government, were interested in quality control. We will test and make sure your petrol is fit for the engines that are running in Nigeria. And once that happens, you will begin to see investors coming to the sector, importing petrol, and selling at prices that give them a profit. And once people see people making a lot of profit from that uh, business, they will start coming into the sector. And gradually, the prices will start coming down because competition will set in. That is one thing. The other thing is that why are we having pressure on petrol in Nigeria? We're having pressure on petrol in Nigeria because we have a government that is seeing our gas being fled and they are doing nothing about it. Instead of harnessing the gas and putting them into power plants so that we can generate electricity for the entire country, Nigerians are living in darkness, so they have all sorts of petrol generators all over the place, and they are going to the petrol station to buy petrol to put in those generators. If government just lets electricity to be supplied to this economy, there will be no need for those small, small generators that are having pressure on petrol. Okay. That is the other thing. Okay. Yes. Uh, um, uh, Mr. Guli, you know, last year or so, if I remember correctly, um, when this issue of um, fuel subsidy removal came up, and labor began to, to make some noise. I think it should be either 2021 or 2020. Um, the federal government called the labor leaders, NLC, TUC, um, into to a round table and uh, set up a committee um, to look at certain issues uh, and to see how best to fix a price that will uh, be favorable to, to the people. Um, if we talk about the petroleum industry, 
at. Um, we are aware that Labour has been also a very, very active part in the discussions that have been going on, you know, and the public hearings that have been going on. Um, and many unions within the larger umbrella of Labour in Nigeria, especially the oil and gas industry, made presentations and submitted papers and memoranda whilst the discussions with the PIA was, was, um, was, was were, were going on. Now, if you're talking about deregulation of, of this sector and uh, the expected implementation of PIA, you are saying the government is departing. Well, the Senate president is saying Labour needs to shelve its planned strike for now because the federal government has backtracked on its decision. But they're saying there's no going back on the track. But people are asking, Labour has been part of the process and has been aware of what's coming for some time now, so why are they making some noise? What, what do you say to this? Well, I, 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 I duly support Labour for their agitations because they are representing the, the people are called the masses of the country. But Labour also has to look at this issue dispassionately. They have to take away their eyes from emotions. They don't have to be emotional about these issues. Number one, if we have subsidy removed today, who are the people that will be worst hit? The first people that will be worst hit are West African countries. West African countries, it's not even Nigerians. West African countries that come to Nigeria and smuggle our subsidized petrol to their own countries. At the advent of the current regime, daily consumption of petrol was being estimated at around 30 million liters per day. Today we're talking 60, 70 million liters. Have the number of cars on Nigerian roads doubled? The answer is no. Where is that petrol going? About 30 to 40 million liters of petrol are being smuggled across Nigeria's borders into West African countries. And the people who we lose will be those West African countries. We have small, small West African countries like Benetogo that are buying petrol at market prices and the economies have not collapsed. So when you now talk about Nigeria buying petrol at market prices and you say the economy, this is scare monitoring. So that is the first group that we lose. Who are the second group that will be hit? The second group that will be hit are car owners. The people who have cars in Nigeria. The masses don't have cars. If you go to all the villages, do they have cars? They don't have cars. By the way, this subsidized petrol hardly sells at 165 Naira in the villages. It actually only sells 165 Naira in big cities like Lagos and Abuja, where the rich men have dozens of cars. You go to some estate, you are going to see seven, eight, twelve, fifteen cars parked in front of residences of big men. They will be the people that will be hit. And of course, those who are benefiting from the subsidy regime through corrupt means will be the worst hit as well. So the message that labor is actually fighting for are going to be the last on the ladder in terms of those who will be hit. So why should a poor woman go into a petrol station to buy kerosene at market prices, an artisan who needs diesel in his machine to be able to do his work for the day, goes into a petrol station to buy diesel at market prices, then the billionaire that comes with his convoy of SUVs into that petrol station is now buying petrol at 165. And who is paying for the 165? Is the money that should have been used to provide health care, education, roads, and other infrastructure for the masses that is being used to subsidize the billionaire and his convoy of SUVs. Mm. So these are the issues that the government must look, I mean, labor must look at dispassionately and ask mm. who is actually benefiting from this subsidy as we speak now. And now let me tell you one thing. The budget, the national budget, the federal government budget, that President Buhari signed into law did not provide for subsidy from July to December. Now that the government says they will provide for the subsidy, where is the money going to come from? The money is going to come from borrowings. So Nigeria is now going to go and borrow because in the, the, the entire revenue of government for 2022 is just about five or six trillion and we are running a budget of uh, 17 trillion. I mean, the revenue is 8 trillion, and we're running a budget of 17 trillion. So if uh, additional cost uh, through subsidy is going to come in, 
in July to December, it it will be money that will be borrowed. So how can we go borrowing? Okay, Nick, I will yeah. Um, we're out of time now, and let's just add this as we share your thoughts in a minute or so. Um, so one of the reasons that the federal government has cited for taking that step backwards is that the timing is problematic, and one would wonder, I mean, what were you thinking in the first instance? But what time is better? They have also cited the issue of uh, you know, high inflation, of course, on the grounds of economy, and that it would take a serious toll on Nigerians. So well, the question now is, what is the better time to remove subsidy? Oh, well, so the, the, the question as a federal government is that subsidy was removed on kerosene. They didn't bother about the inflationary uh, effect on the masses. It was removed on diesel, which is used in the productive sector. They didn't bother about the inflationary uh, pressures on the items that are used in the productive sector, like food is carried in trucks that use diesel. They didn't bother about all that. So I would say that this whole issue of the government lacking courage to take this decisive step could also be anything to do with politics. Because now they believe that if Nigerians are angry with them, election is coming up just next year. What I would then say is that if the government has, has now uh, become lily levered to backtrack on what they want to do, then let the government start setting aside crude oil. Crude oil, which they will give to the Dangote refinery, which is expected to commence refining in the third quarter of this year. The government of Nigeria should start feeding Dangote refinery with crude oil at cost, not okay. market prices, All right. at cost, because this crude oil belongs to us. And All Dangote right. refinery will be able to refine this crude and sell it to Nigeria, even below the current... That's, that's, that's certainly a, another issue that we can spend uh, another 30 minutes talking about. We certainly would hope for another time and opportunity with you, Mr. Julie, to, to discuss this further. But thank you very much for joining us on The Breakfast this morning. Thank you very much, and have a nice day. All right. All right. Very interesting, Mercy, uh, conversations around subsidy removal and, of course, um, uh, the confusion and the back and forth between the president, uh, the Senate president, uh, the minister of, uh, of finance, national planning and budgeting, and the GMD of the defunct NNPC, all making these statements. And it was a bit confusing. You're not seeing a clear-cut policy direction or policy statement from government. Well, he said it all, the 4.6 trillion era um, and the, the, the excesses or the balance of the subsidy from the middle of the year to the end of the year will have to go up boring. And the fact that, you know, we constantly, uh, there's a lot of projection for the dependence on the Dangote refinery as, uh, you know, way out. I'm talking about the modular as a refinery. Sort of a, a silver, a silver bullet. It can't be a silver bullet because he's a capitalist. Profit would always be on top of the question. I mean, it would always be his thoughts. So that's also another case. The fact that you think that that will be a way out, I quite, I, I don't know what that would well, be. Well, I, I don't think Nigerian, I don't think Nigerians are expecting that Dangote will give them petrol for free. No, but he's saying that, you know, that uh, if you listen to Nika Gule, he said that uh, when petrol is being, uh, at the end of the day, it will be sold, you know, at a particular rate. But you also want to agree with me that he is in business and profit is always it. Well, well, we've been told that the, um, not turnaround maintenance, but the rehabilitation of um, certain refineries in the country, uh, we expect that very soon they will be on stream. A uh, report was given uh, by the the government to the National Assembly, particularly the Port Haggard refinery. And let's see if we can get the refining capacity up a bit by the time Dangote becomes fully operational, which won't be 2022. I mean, fully operational, 100% capacity. I don't expect that to be 2000. 2022. But let's just hope um, that the nation's refineries can be actively refining at full capacity in a couple of, uh, in a year or two's time. But we we'll keep watching this space. Definitely, okay. we will. All we right. Will. Uh, well, we need to go. Thank you so much for being part of the show. It's been a great time, two hours of an amazing conversation. We will return tomorrow with the breakfast. If you missed out on any part of the conversation, it's all right to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, what, Plus TV Africa. And uh, do subscribe to our YouTube channel at Plus TV Africa Lifestyle and Plus TV Africa as well. I am Messi Boko. Have yourself a fantastic day. And I'm Kofi Bartels. We're 10 tomorrow. Good morning.